I'm not, I don't need to introduce you to myself, but there are Dean for Academic Affairs, and we're going to talk about understanding the LCME process. Many of you know this well and have been to multiple relevant presentations. So I have no disclosures to make. I don't have any uh, financial interests that are impacted by this, though I have been a site visitor for the LCME on several site visits. So uh, I, I have that as a background or bias, if you will. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about the function and organization of the Liaison Committee on Medical Education, which is what LCME stands for. We're going to summarize the various LCME standards. We'll hit on all of them briefly. We'll explain the LCME accreditation process, and we'll explain the roles of uh, faculty, institutional bodies, and the administrative units in satisfying the LCME accreditation requirements. But before we get into that, I forgot the advertisement. Uh, we have another book club coming up in January, and if you're interested in participating, the book for this book club is called Grit by Angela Duckworth. This is a very interesting book. Uh, she spoke at uh, AAMC a couple of years ago and gave a very excellent talk. I understand she's as good a writer as she is a speaker. So the, this session will be held in January. If you're interested in going, grab a book. There, Dr. McGowan has more than the two that are left over there. Sign your life away and show up for the uh, book club. <laughs> So what is the LCME? It is the body that's recognized by the U.S. Department of Education as the accrediting body for allopathic medical education in the U.S. It is different from the body that um, accredits osteopathic programs. They have different standards, a different entity. The LCME is jointly sponsored by the American Medical Association and the Association of American Medical Colleges. And there's a professional secretary uh, which is secretaries in high level like federal departments from AMA and one from LCME that come together to form the LCME Secretariat. Please sign in. So it consists of 15 members who are people like us. They're medical educators, they're administrators, some of them are practicing physicians. It has two public members and this year the public members are a pharmacist and a retired professor in uh, family and consumer sciences, and it has two fourth-year medical students. This year, one is from Harvard, one is from Florida State. So the LCME's purpose is really to try and elevate and improve medical education. So the accreditation process is a peer-reviewed quality assurance process. They have a strong emphasis on quality assurance and quality improvement that determines whether or not a medical education program meets established standards, and we'll talk through what those standards are. It's intended to foster institutional and programmatic self-evaluation and improvement. The LCME establishes the standards, and it requires that programs demonstrate their graduates exhibit professional competencies appropriate for the next stage of training, which of course for medical students is residency training, and that serve as a foundation for lifelong learning and proficient medical care. So lifelong learning is one of the important emphases, as we'll see. So there are 12 standards organized into 90-some elements now. So the, these are the broad-level standards, uh, mission planning, organization, and integrity, leadership and administration, academic and learning environments, faculty preparation, productivity, participation and policies, educational resources and infrastructure, competencies, curricular objectives, and curricular design, curricular content, curricular management, evaluation and enhancement, teaching, supervision, assessment, and student and patient safety, medical student selection, assignment progress, medical student academic support, career advising and educational records, and medical student health services, personal counseling, and financial aid services. So you can see these standards cover a broad swath of uh, medical education. It's not just the educational program. It's not just teaching, but it's all the support elements that allow a program to be successful. And so now we're going to march through the standards and the elements. So a standard is a big level thing like mission planning, organization, and integrity, and it's got all these elements underneath it. And we'll go through them, hitting on each one briefly. So uh, element 1.1 is strategic planning and continuous quality improvement. And this standard says two things. One is that you have to have a strategic planning process. So we have a strategic plan that was developed in 2013. 
We accomplished not everything, but a lot of things on that strategic plan. A lot has changed since that plan was developed. The environment around us has changed. And so we're in the process now of developing a new strategic plan. <clears throat> it's received input regarding the various components. So there's like an undergraduate medical education component and MSEC uh, had a discussion about issues related to that. There's GME, there's research, there's uh, clinical operations. And <clears throat> so all of those have provided input. We've had consultants from the AAMC here. They're gonna be coming back in December to look at that with us again. So we have a plan from 2013. We did some of the things on the plan. There's a lot on the plan we didn't do. We're working on developing a new plan. And you also have to have a continuous quality improvement program related to how you're doing at accomplishing these 12 standards and their elements. And so <clears throat> we have had an ongoing quality, uh, continuous quality improvement program. We've given reports at the administrative council, at the leadership group, to the faculty advisory council. Some of those have come to uh, MSEC. And so we've been looking on a systematic and regular basis over the past three years at how we're doing with respect to the standards. <clears throat> 1.2 says we have to have conflicts of in conflict of interest policies. And there are multiple conflict of interest policies that pertain to us. So uh, the TBR conflict of interest policy still applies. When we had a new board established here through the Tennessee Focus Act, it basically said T TBR policies will still apply until the local board has established its own policy to replace that. And so they've not replaced the conflict of interest policy, so we still fall into the TBR policy. But we have multiple other conflicts of interest policy. So we have conflicts of interest policy related to research, related to continuing medical education, related to interaction with industry, related to the admissions committee, related to the promotions committee. And so all of those apply. One of the things that our consultants said when they came through recently was best practices today really say that every faculty member would complete a conflict of interest disclosure every year. We've not been doing that, uh, but we are going to be asking the chairs to have their faculty members complete a conflict of interest disclosure uh, this year. Some of you will say, oh, but I've already done that multiple times. And so you can check the box that says, I have no conflicts that I've not already disclosed. Uh, and you won't have to redisclose all those research conflicts of interest and CME conflicts of interest. And then <clears throat> in future years, we're just going to build that form right into the faculty uh, uh, evaluation process. So every year when you do your FAPFAR phase, there'll just be a page on that that you just sign and it'll, it'll be done. Mechanisms for faculty participation gets at the idea that faculty need to be involved in the life and governance of the medical school. And faculty need to have the opportunity to participate in the governance of the medical school. And so one of the ways they look at that is do faculty members have an opportunity to participate in committees that determine institutional policies? And so we have a procedure for committee appointments. And it says when there are openings on committees, there will be an email that goes out to the faculty letting them know about appointments. You've seen some of those recently. They came out for uh, faculty senate, MSEC, uh, student promotions, uh, admissions committee, <clears throat> that people will identify their interest, that those interests will be reviewed by the relevant administrator brought to faculty advisory council for input, vetted, and then appointed by the dean as appropriate. And so <clears throat> we do use that process to make sure that people know what we're getting into. So we had a faculty member uh, volunteer to be on the medical student curriculum committee who's 90 percent research has no medical student involvement and his supervisor said this person would be more appropriate to be involved on the graduate education committee than the medical student education committee so we found a place for them to be involved but <clears throat> there are mechanisms for faculty uh, participation the faculty advisory council is the elected representative body of the faculty there is a member uh, from each department more than member one member from biomedical sciences so we have that. Affiliation agreements are those agreements that we have with our clinical partners. And we have three main clinical partners. They're the VA, they're Ballad, and there's Covenant Health Systems. And those affiliation agreements have five specific elements that they're supposed to include. Things like they assure us they'll make teaching resources available to us, that we'll have the right to appoint faculty members and evaluate our students, that there will be provisions made if students are injured while in those settings they'll get appropriate care, et cetera. <laughs> Uh, bylaws, we have faculty bylaws. They're published on the College of Medicine website under the dean's office. They specify responsibilities of 
faculty, the dean, various committees, and that sort of thing. Uh, eligibility requirements get set to be uh, an LCME accredited institution, you have to be part of a regionally accredited institution. So our SACS accreditation is what accomplishes us being eligible for LCME accreditation. So for the most part, our faculty here are relatively insulated from the SACS accreditation process. We uh, predominantly take care of that through academic affairs, but sometimes I may ask you for data. Like Jerry, I asked you for some data recently related to some endpoints that we looked at for the SACS accreditation. Did you have comments, Dr. Linville, or you're just <laughs> rolling your eyes there? Um, so, um, standard two gets at leadership and administration. So, element 2.1 uh, asks, how are administrative officers and faculty appointed? Who has the authority to do this? And so, the authority really lies with the Board of Trustees. It delegates that authority to the president of the university. The president is the person who appoints um, the, uh, uh, who ultimately uh, offers uh, appointments to faculty members and is responsible for appointing the senior administrative staff. The president usually does not directly make decisions about associate deans and that sort of thing, but uh, delegates that to the dean of the College of, Me College of Medicine. 2.2, dean's qualifications, just gets at the idea, is the person who's dean of the medical school, do they have appropriate uh, qualifications to be that? And so we outline the qualifications of our dean, and they are appropriate. 2.3, access and authority of the dean, gets at, does the dean have access to higher levels of university administration? So the dean regularly reports through uh, the vice president for health affairs, Dr. Bishop, to the president, but the dean also has access to the president, interacts with the president uh, in various settings, um, and also has regular meetings with the uh, CEO of Ballard. So that's what this is getting at. Does the dean have authority and access to address those uh, higher up? Sufficiency of the administrative staff really gets at the dean staff. Does the dean have a sufficient number of senior administrators to carry out the program. So those are department chairs, associate deans, assistant deans, and there are a sufficient number. Uh, what does the dean actually have responsibility for? Does the dean have responsibility for deployment of resources in the College of Medicine, for making decisions uh, about budgets, about the clinical practice, for being involved in decision making about the educational program? 2.6, functional integration of the faculty really doesn't pertain to us because that gets at schools that have multiple regional campuses. And if you have uh, a completely separate campus in Knoxville, for example, how is that functionally integrated into a whole? So that really doesn't apply to us. Our rural sites are, don't really qualify as those uh, independent uh, campuses because only a part of our educational program occurs there. But it's talking about where you have a separate campus where all of the educational program occurs. Um, so now we move to academic and learning environments. 3.1, resident participation in medical student education is just that medical students have to be trained at a setting where they're exposed to resident physicians involved in ACGM accre ACGME accredited residency programs. And we have plenty of that. Basically, all of our core clerkships, with the exception of community medicine, uh, and the rural track clerkship have significant exposure to uh, residents and training, so uh, we meet that. Community of scholars and research opportunities gets at, do medical students have an opportunity to be involved in research? So the summer program that Aaron runs, for example, is a great uh, example of that. Um, our students do have an opportunity to be involved in research. They're generally satisfied. Our students participate in research at a lower level than nationally. About 58% of our students over the past two or three years have said on the graduation questionnaire, I was involved in research with a faculty member, and that compares to more like 80% for national numbers. <clears throat> Diversity and pipeline programs. Um, so this is an area that, that's a challenge for us living in the region of the country we live in. It's not a highly diverse region. We have defined categories of diversity that were changed this year based on recommendation, recommendations from the Diversity Council and a vote of the faculty. So the categories now are much broader categories. So one of the categories are groups that are historically underrepresented in medicine, including underrepresented minorities. So instead of saying African-American, Hispanic, et cetera, there's one group that encompasses all of that. 
And then for medical students, military service backgrounds, another group, and people that come from disadvantaged socioeconomic backgrounds is another group. So that would be coming from a rural, medically underserved area, uh, uh, economically disadvantaged, first generation college student, uh, those groups are all lumped into there. And then for faculty and senior administrative staff, women is a separate category. We do pretty, well we do fine really with women at the medical student level. We're at about 50-50 at this point, varies a little bit from year to year. Women are still significantly underrepresented among the faculty and the senior administrative staff, though we've been making gains. So if you look at our last site visit, we just had like 27% or so of our uh, faculty uh, were women, and now we're up to, um, it's the upper 30s now with a similar proportion in senior administrative positions, and if you look at hires over the last couple of years, it was more than 50% women. So we're, we're making progress, not where we need to be. Pipeline programs get to the idea that <clears throat> we have programs where we identify people early on and we uh, follow them over time to try and encourage them to enter the pipeline of people applying to medical school. And we've identified uh, four programs uh, in our data collection instrument uh, that are pipeline programs. They're not all as fully developed as they should be, but they're places where we encounter people earlier on and we have some data about what happens to them. There's one that's been uh, conducted uh, at the, uh, in a local housing project, Carver Recreation Center, called Color My World, and we actually have at least one student who got exposed to the College of Medicine from activities at the Carver Recreation Center who have uh, applied to and matriculated to medical school. Um, we have uh, uh, the rural high sc uh, schools, uh, uh, the rural summer camp program uh, where students come in for a week. We have 25 students come in for a week, spend time with our medical students engaged in a variety of activities. And we've had uh, some of those students matriculate to medical school or to apply to other schools. We have the uh, Medical Horizons program, which is not ex uh, limited just to our diversity groups, but does prioritize people in our diverse groups when they apply. And that's been a pretty good pipeline. And then we have a program called HealthQuest, which was started more recently uh, Dr. Lura has been involved in that in association with the uh, multicultural office on the ETSU main campus to take underrepresented minority students who are interested in medicine, connect them with some of our students to mentor with them, and two of the students in the uh, first year of that program have uh, matriculated other medical schools. Uh, Anti-discrimination policy, we have anti-discrimination policies that are adequate. Um, the learning environment and professionalism. So <clears throat> professionalism is part of what we do. If you look at our institutional educational objectives, which are posted on the wall, I know you can't read them, but professionalism is one of the eight major areas we look at, and we've defined specific professional uh, professionalism objectives that we want our students to accomplish. We've identified places in the curriculum where those are addressed. Um, and related to that is the learning environment. And the learning environment gets at the idea that we want to have an environment that is nurturing and fostering. We want students to be learning in an environment where they are encouraged, where they're excited about coming here, where they're, where they're not beaten down and discouraged. Now, granted, there's an element of that to medical school, which we all uh, appreciate, but the learning environment is one of the things that um, LCME believes to be an important thing. And I think most of us uh, would agree that it's an important thing. And um, our data are pretty good in terms of the learning uh, environment. We get data from uh, internal surveys. We get data from um, the AAMC graduation questionnaire, from the AAMC year two survey. Um, and in general, uh, we're doing pretty well there. There's always room for improvement. One of the things that we do see is there are some aspects of the hidden curriculum that come into play here. Things that we teach, things that we say we want you to do versus what they see. And so there are some things where they see disconnects between what they're taught and what is modeled. Uh, student mistreatment is uh, an important issue and we're gonna talk about that a little later in the presentation. So the Standard related to faculty gets at several things. 4.1 is just sufficiency of faculty. What are your faculty numbers? Are they appropriate for what you need to do? 4.2 is scholarly productivity. 
Do you have faculty members that are involved in scholarly activities that are generating new knowledge and that provide an opportunity for students to participate in that? Faculty appointment policies. Do you have policies so that when somebody comes on as a faculty member, they know what faculty track they're in, they know what their job responsibilities are going to be, they know what their compensation is going to be, they know who their supervisor is. Faculty to professional development. Well, we're doing some of that right now. So faculty professional development would be things that would include this. It would also be going to specialty meetings. It might be going to research meetings. We sponsor uh, course directors going to course director meetings. Um, departments conduct uh, grand rounds. They conduct research conferences. All of those things are part of faculty professional development. We also have the ETSU Center for Academic Excellence. That's where Dr. Johnson, who's done our book clubs, uh, uh, has come from. She's provided other expertise. Uh, responsibility for educational programs gets at are the faculty involved in being responsible for the programs. They're involved in delivering the programs by being faculty members. They serve as course directors. Those course directors are generally appointed by department chairs. Faculty members are uh, members of various educational committees. There's the curriculum committee itself, MSEC. There are the <coughs> M1, M2, M3, M4 review subcommittees. There's an outcome subcommittee. There's a curriculum integration subcommittee. There's promotions committee. There's admissions committee. So there are opportunities for faculty to be involved uh, in the educational program. Standard 5 gets at resources and infrastructure. So are there adequate financial resources? So we submit data uh, over several years that looks at what our sources of income are, what our uh, expense categories are. And while not a wealthy school, we've had a pretty stable pattern of uh, finances uh, since our previous site visit. Uh, is the dean authorized to run the medical school like it needs to be done, and does he have the resources to do that? Uh, those resources are not just financial resources. Pressures for self-financing gets at are we putting too much emphasis on tuition to pay for the medical school? And so for us, we're not. The tuition uh, that comes in is 7 to 8% of our total budget. So most of our uh, income for the medical school does not come uh, from tuition. Sufficiencies of building and equipment. Do we have enough uh, space that's appropriately maintained? Uh, it's a, a pleasant, conducive environment. The air conditioner is working. Uh, for the education program. An area where I think that some people would say is an area we need to be looking at for the future is the type of uh, space that we have available, that our space has been configured more for um, a lecture-based curriculum and as we're evolving to include some other methodologies, some of the space is a little bit constraining. Uh, resources for clinical instruction gets at do we have enough hospital placements for our students? Is the patient volume in those hospitals sufficient to allow them to see the patient types and sorts of procedures they need to fulfill the educational objectives? Uh, clinical instructional facilities and information resources gets at support facilities at the hospitals to support the educational program. Are there call rooms? Are there conference rooms? Are there lockers where students can put things? Are, are there libraries at the hospitals? Uh, security, student safety, and disaster preparedness gets at pretty much what it sounds like. So we have to talk about our security systems, how students are notified in the event of uh, disaster, what we do to train them to be prepared for that. Uh, standard five, library resources and staff. Uh, at our mock site visit, our visitors were uh, 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 delighted with uh, what they saw from the library. Uh, information technology resources and staff, that includes not just that in the College of Medicine, but uh, that from the ETSU main campus. Resources used by transfer and visiting students. So this gets at, are you taking more students than you have resources to train? So we, fit, we currently have no transfer students here at the College of Medicine. We take very few transfer students. And visiting students, we determine the number that we can take and don't take any more than that. So this year, I think we're up at something like 20, uh, some students are doing electives during the fourth year of medical school as visiting students. <clears throat> Study space, uh, lounge, storage space, call rooms is just what it says. Uh, do you have an adequate uh, number of those? 
required notifications to LCME if you've had an event that uh, required a notification such as a significant increase in class size, major change in curriculum, have you notified LCME? Uh, we notified them of uh, the board change uh, in the past and we notified them about uh, updating our SACS accreditation. We did not really notify them when we made changes in curriculum. We didn't think that rose to the threshold. They needed to be notified about that. Now we're getting into the core educational uh, elements and these are really important. So the first is program and learning objectives. So we have institutional educational objectives. They're in the poster on the wall over here. There are eight main areas. There are several underneath each one. And those objectives are uh, course and clerkships are supposed to link to those objectives. If you're teaching something in a course or clerkship and you can't tie it to one of those objectives, a fair question is do you need to be teaching it? But these are pretty broad objectives, and most anything you teach, you should be able to tie to these. Uh, required clinical experiences. Have we defined the clinical experiences that we think students need to have in order to accomplish the educational objectives for the program? We have defined those. We've defined the settings in which they should occur, the clinical rotations in which we think they should occur, and students document those through the new innovations uh, uh, educational suite, and we monitor that centrally in academic affairs. Self-directed and lifelong learning is a standard that is felt to be important because of what we're training people for. We're training them to go into a career that doesn't have static knowledge and where knowledge at the end of medical school is not going to be enough to get them very far. And so they want to, LCME wants to know that students have the skills to be lifelong learners. An important place that we begin to accomplish that is in the case-based learning component of the Doctoring One course, where students self-identify their own learning needs, they look for resources to help meet those needs, they appraise the uh, quality of those resources, they come back and present the information and they receive feedback on that. Now that's not the only place to get it, there's a similar activity in uh, the microbiology course, the immunization workshop uh, that students do where they have that and there are some aspects of that in the practice of medicine components of the Doctoring II course. Inpatient outpatient experiences just as students have to have both and that you have a balance and that you evaluate that and we do each clerkship has a, a proportion that is spent in inpatient versus outpatient experience and we monitor that at the MSEC level. Elective opportunities. Students need to have opportunities to do electives and they need to be provided guidance on how to select those electives. So each student in the third year picks a clinical advisor who's appropriate to the special they're interested in. They have a range of electives um, available to them and they select from those. Service learning gets at the idea that students are doing service that is connected to learning objectives and through doing that service they accomplish those educational objectives. So they have a required service learning activity in the Doctoring One course where that activity needs to be tied to some of the <coughs> educational objectives for the course. They do a minimum of 10 hours of service, many choose to do more, and then they submit a written reflection showing how this activity that I participated in helped me accomplish educational uh, objectives for the course. Now beyond that there's just community service opportunities and there are multiple community service opportunities. Academic environment gets at the idea that this educational program is conducted in a place where other people are being educated. So we have graduate students, nursing students, pharmacy students, nursing students, public health students, etc. Educational program duration is a pretty simple one. Has to be at least 130 weeks. We are. Um, so the curricular content says what do you need to include in the curriculum and uh, <clears throat> there's a standard 7.1 that talks about the different biomedical sciences that need to be represented in the curriculum but also the beha behavioral and social sciences. Interestingly there was recently an editorial written by a guy named Sidney Goldfarb who was a dean I think at Penn talking about how we put so much behavioral and social science in the curriculum, it's diluting the biomedical sciences. And, uh, pardon me? Uh, and there was, a, <laughs> there was a lot of, it evoked a vigorous discussion. 7.2 is a huge element, and it's one that we've worked on a lot in MSEC that says you have to cover all the organ systems, 
all the life cycle, primary care, preventive care, wellness, symptoms of disease, uh, signs of disease, differential diagnosis, treatment planning, and the impact of behavioral and social uh, factors. So there's a lot of stuff that it covers there. Uh, scientific method, clinical and translational research. When we actually started doing our self-study, we thought, we're not really doing very well here. But the more we dug into things and saw things in our curriculum, there are multiple places where this is addressed. In particular, it starts with the clinical epidemiology and biostatistics program. Uh, there are some of our courses that have lab experiences where they collect data and draw inferences from the lab data. There are Rick Wallace works on students on the community medicine clerkship to introduce them to epidemiologic databases and they have assignments to look at that database, collect information, draw inferences. Uh, multiple clerkships have some sort of uh, assessing research or evidence-based medicine uh, assignments that students uh, have. They have an evidence-based medicine assignment in OBGYN and family medicine. They have one in psychiatry. So we think this is actually pretty well covered. Uh, critical judgment and problem solving skills, we address these throughout the curriculum. So we need our students not just to be memorizers and regurgitators of fact, but they need to be able to apply that fact and, and look at undifferentiated things and say, based on the knowledge I have, this seems to be the most likely approach. So that's addressed both in the first two years of the curriculum and then in the clinical aspects of the curriculum as well. Societal problems, uh, we have to define societal problems that we're looking at and how we're addressing it in our curriculum. And I actually forgot to uh, jot those down before coming up here. So help me, Ramsey, but they're like substance abuse, which includes uh, tobacco, alcohol, the opioid uh, disorder, uh, physical inactivity, and obesity. And, and uh, health disparities, isn't that? Yeah. Uh, so those are included in our curriculum and addressed at appropriate places. Cultural competence and healthcare disparities is actually a, an additional standard. So are students learning how to take care of people from culturally diverse groups? And are they understanding how to approach people with limited uh, resources and access to care? And our students get ample exposure to that. Medical ethics is addressed at a variety of places in the curriculum, starts in the Doctoring One course and continues throughout the curriculum. Communication skills, likewise, starts in the Doctoring One course and continues throughout. Interprofessional collaborative skills are something that we have been engaged in to an increasing extent. As you know, our institution is pretty committed to the idea of interprofessional education, and it's now a required part of the Doctoring One and Two courses. They have uh, four half days of interprofessional activity, formal activity with students from other parts of the healthcare uh, educational programs. And then when they're on the clinical uh, clerkships, they have exposure to the delivery of interprofessional healthcare in different settings. Curriculum management. <clears throat> so one of the big standards that LCME is concerned about is that we have an effective curriculum management system and that what's happening in our curriculum is intentional and not just random. We don't have uh, five different faculty members just deciding this is what I'm going to teach, but we have a cohesive curriculum where we decide what needs to be taught and those five different faculty members help us deliver that program. So our curriculum management program is uh, under the, the purview of MSEC. We use the medical education program objectives. They're the th ones that are we call institutional educational objectives. All courses and clerkships have their educational objectives tied to these. We have a robust curriculum design review and revision process. We did not at our previous site visit, and this was one of our areas of citation. But now, as uh, any of you who are involved in courses know, we have annual course director uh, self-studies that are submitted and they're reviewed by either the first and second year curriculum review subcommittee or the third and fourth uh, year curriculum review subcommittee. Every three years we have a comprehensive course review. Then uh, during the uh, fourth year of the curriculum, and we're there right now, we review the different phases of the curriculum. We have two phases. We have a pre-clerkship phase, years one and two, and a clinical phase, years three and four. 
We're the phase review ad hoc committee is meeting tomorrow uh, to go over its result. And then we'll begin a process of comprehensive review of the curriculum in the remainder of the year to determine whether or not we need to make uh, uh, changes and any of those changes we'd have implementation plans for in the following year. Program evaluation gets at the idea that we use data in an organized way to look at how we're doing in accomplishing these institutional educational objectives. And we have a subcommittee of the curriculum committee, the outcomes committee, that does that. So for each one of these eight uh, standards under our institutional ed educational objectives, we've defined a variety of outcome measures with benchmarks saying we think we should perform at this level as an indicator that we're accomplishing that. That committee meets quarterly. It looks at benchmarks at different times of the year based on when the data is coming in and reports that to uh, MSEC. Uh, <clears throat> medical student feedback uh, is, this is where we use feedback from medical students to uh, assess how the program is doing. And so we get that in a variety of different ways. You know we have the student evaluation system where students evaluate courses, clerkships, and faculty members. And then we also use data that comes in from other surveys like the AAMC Year 2 Questionnaire, the AAMC Graduation Questionnaire. So we use, uh, and, and then at the end of each year, we have uh, what we call a reflective survey where we say to the students, now that you've finished the first year, the second year, the third year, look back on the year as a whole and give us any thoughts you have about how it worked and opportunities for improvement. Did I miss anything there? Uh, monitoring of completion of required clinical experiences. So I told you we've defined patient types and diagnoses uh, and procedures that students need to see. And students are supposed to document that and we're supposed to monitor to make sure it happens. We do that. So I've told you we do it through new innovations. When a student's on a clerkship, they meet with a clerkship director midway through mid-clerkship review. One of the things they go over is how they're accomplishing those we also look at those centrally in academic affairs. Um, comparability of educational assessment gets at the idea if you have two students at two different sites doing a similar activity, it really should be pretty comparable. That <clears throat> if you have a student, and the main places this applies for us are in rural track or family medicine. If you have students doing family medicine in Bristol, Kingsport, and Johnson City, what do you do to ensure that the students in Kingsport get a relatively similar experience to the students in Bristol? And we do have <coughs> policies and practices related to that, and we monitor data on an annual basis to ensure that those experiences are comparable. Monitoring student time. Um, this really gets at time on the clerkships, and the idea should be that students actually have enough time to, to learn. They're not just uh, doing uh, uh, work or be sort of work the whole time. So we have a, a policy <clears throat> that says, in general, uh, students should not more, work more than 80 hours a week when they're on clerkships, and we monitor that, and we're doing fine there. So another aspect of student time that I forgot to mention was earlier on when we were talking about self-directed learning. And an aspect of student time that is looked at there is that do students have enough time during the week to do independent work related to learning? That is, we haven't scheduled every hour of the day so they don't have time to, to sit down and learn. So our policy says, on average, students should not have more than 28 hours of required activity per week in the preclinical years. And that includes time required to prepare for classes for flipped classrooms. Uh, when we had our uh, mock site visit, the mock site visitors thought, gee, that's, that's pretty high. There's not a lot of additional uh, uh, available time there. But uh, when we told them that does include the time for required outside of class preparation, they were a little more comfortable with that. Um, so when we have people other than faculty members that are teaching our residents, our, our students, like residents or non-faculty instructors, we need to make sure that we've prepared them for the job they do. So we have formal preparation for resident as teacher. We have policy related to that. We have practices. The Office of GME provides annual resident as teacher training. Each department also provides relevant training for their residents. 
Uh, and if they're non-faculty instructors, and we don't really have very many of these at all, uh, but an example would be the micro lab. The people that are teaching in the micro lab, they know what the educational objectives are and what the students are expected to do for that. Faculty appointments, do people teaching medical students have faculty appointments? And we've worked hard to ensure that all of our volunteer faculty do have faculty appointments. Clinical supervision of medical students. When medical students are out there, are they appropriately supervised? We're not just turning them loose to go do uh, major procedures on patients. And, and they are. We have a policy on clinical supervision of medical students. It specifies different levels of supervision. It specifies those providing the supervision should be appropriately credentialed to provide the care that's involved in that. So uh, I should not be supervising a student doing appendectomies because I'm not qualified to do an appendectomy. <clears throat> and so we have policies and practices in place. Assessment system gets at how we assess students, and it wants to know that we use a wide variety of measures to do that, and we do. We use written exam sort of assessments. We use nationally standardized assessments. We use uh, clinical assessments where we have direct observation of students. We have OSCE exams they do. We have a wide variety of ways that we assess students. Narrative assessment gets at when individual faculty and student interaction permits it, there should be a narrative written assessment of how you've done that deals with things that are outside of just the cognitive domain. And <clears throat> we do that in uh, several pre-clerkship courses. Both the doctoring courses provide narrative assessment from a variety of different uh, means of input. It's done in the anatomy course. It's done in the laboratory portion of the microbiology course. And heroically, Dr. Mullersman has done it for the Biostats and Epi course. I always wondered how he pulled that off, but he's done it two years in a row now. So, And all the clerkships provide narrative assessment. Uh, setting standards of achievement. How do we set standards of achievement? Here's the bar you have to reach in order to pass this course, to be promoted to the next level, et cetera. And are those uniform? So those are set uh, by faculty members in courses and in clerkships and at the uh, promotions committee level. Formative assessment and feedback. Do students get feedback along the way letting them know how they're doing? So if they're getting off track or in trouble, they know that. And so we have a formal policy on formative <coughs> assessment saying at least by the midpoint of any educational experience, a student should know how they're doing. If they're not performing satisfactorily, they need to get that in writing, be asked to come in and meet with the course director to uh, discuss that. Uh, student uh, and uh, timely, uh, fair and timely summit of assessment. <clears throat> so assessment should be fair. I shouldn't evaluate Dr. McGowan one way and Dr. Linville another way. They should both be evaluated uh, uh, using uniform standards. And timely gets at how quickly the evaluations get back. So we have no problems with that. At the pre-clerkship uh, level, courses regularly get their grades in on time. Most of the clerkships are doing a, a great job of getting grades in on time. We've had a few clerkship periods over the past three years where they were late getting in, and that's an area we work on. Student advancement and appeal process. Uh, you all know from having uh, seen information about needing to restructure the Student Promotions Committee that our previous structure for the Student Promotions Committee was felt like it would probably not meet this standard because most of the members of the Student Promotions Committee were course and clerkship directors. And LCME has issued the guidance that if you are somebody who's given a student a final grade in a course or clerkship, then you've already formed an opinion of that student and you should not be involved in making subsequent decisions about that student. So we had to reorganize the Promotions Committee so it consists of people that are not course and clerkship directors. We have an appeal process. Uh, students are automatically given a reconsideration hearing by promotions whenever there's a recommendation for an adverse action. If promotions doesn't overturn it on that, at that reconsideration hearing, students can appeal to the dean. And beyond that, if they allege violations of due process, they can appeal, appeal to the vice president. Uh, with the restructuring the student promotions committee, there was an aspect of that that was getting lost. One of the things promotions did was monitor students in real time along the way after various exams. So we've cr created a new committee called the Student Performance and Assessment Review Committee, or SPARC, which will be performing that function of looking at how students are doing along the way. 
Um, <clears throat> these next standards uh, relate to how students are picked for the medical school, the admissions process, et cetera. So do you have defined what kind of pre-medical course requirements are required for the program? We do. They're pretty broad at this point. Uh, final authority of the admissions committee gets at the idea that nobody can undermine the admissions committee. Uh, Dr. Nolan, for example, couldn't say, you know, Scott Nyswanger, he's an important member of our board of directors. He's got a nephew. Let's admit him to medical school. Can't do that. Only the admissions committee can make that decision. The dean can't. Uh, associate deans can't. The president can't. The vice president can't. It's just the admissions committee. We have policies regarding how the admissions committee works, and they're disseminated to interested individuals. They're posted on the catalog. They're posted on our website. They're in our catalog. They're sent out to pre-health uh, advisors at uh, regional colleges and universities. Characteristics of accepted applicants are the students that we take, the kind that we should take in order to be physicians. Do they have the the interpersonal skills, the cognitive abilities, the academic qualifications to be physician. Obviously we have some exceptions, but they're generally the answer to that is yes. Uh, technical standards. What are the minimum standards somebody has to have? What must they be able to do to be a student? So we say they should be able to see, they should be able to hear, they should be able to communicate, they should be able to use various tactile senses to perform the functions of a physician. Content of informational materials is just do we have the stuff there people need to know. That, that's in our catalog and admissions materials. Transfer students, uh, if you take them, do you have adequate resources? We don't have any transfer students now. We rarely take them. Visiting students, we monitor the number of visiting students coming in. Student assignment gets at the idea that if a student is assigned one place and they have some personal reason that that won't work for them, can they be reassigned? Uh, so. Uh, for example, um, if a student, uh, the most common thing is when we have students go to Sevierville for community medicine, there are some for whom that's a personal hardship, and then we develop an alternative locally. Uh, <clears throat> but it could be something also where somebody might have a conflict. They're assigned to uh, go to a hospital, and they have a significant conflict with uh, one of the faculty members who would be supervising them there. So we have uh, procedures whereby they can be reassigned. Uh, academic advising, this is an area that has been a hole for us that we have worked to fill over the past year. Dr. Jean Daniels is our academic counselor. She's with us full time. She's gotten busy, uh, but she's only been with us for a year. So if you look at some of the uh, surveys like the graduation questionnaire, this doesn't look that good. Career advising is conducted through the career exploration courses, which are part of the doctoring courses. Uh, and students have a one-on-one -on -one session with a career advisor of their choice from a selected list in year one, in year two, and in year three, they collect, select a clinical advisor from the specialty area of interest. They're given a list of approved advisors. They select somebody from that. Oversight of extramural electives. If you have students going away to perform electives, how do you provide oversight for that? So if our students are going to another LCM accredited school, we pretty much just accept that that's okay. If they're going to other sites, particularly international sites, we have criteria that are applied for that. And, and that's actually been enhanced quite a bit this year. We have a new policy that's been developed. Dr. David Wood uh, is the director of global health programs. And if a student's going to an international site, they meet with him individually. They look at that site and its appropriateness. Provision of the medical school performance evaluation, the MSPE or Dean's letter, we have a policy related to that. We provide it at the appropriate time of year. It's not to be provided before October 1st. They're generally written by the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, but if the student feels there's a conflict of interest, they can request another letter writer. Confidentiality of student educational records, we adhere to FERPA in terms of the Federal Educational Rights and Privacy Act in terms of confidentiality of records. And students have the right to review their record and make corrections if needed. And they have that right. Financial aid and debt management is a really bright spot for us. <clears throat> uh, our financial aid staff have done a super job uh, over the past few years. And one of the things that has been a pleasant surprise is we've seen a steady fall in indebtedness from 189000 in 2016 at graduation. That's median 
medical school debt down from 189 down to 172 this year. And each year in between, it's just gone down a little bit more. And a lot of that has to do with our financial aid staff working with students to say, just because you take out a loan doesn't mean you have to keep all that money if you don't need it. <clears throat> and in the past, it was a common practice for students to say, I have money left, I'll put it in the bank to save it for a rainy day. And our financial aid staff are saying, turn it back into us within the appropriate time frame. We can turn it back in and the capital on your uh, uh, loan is going to be reduced. They've been listening. Do we have a tuition refund policy? Yes. <clears throat> Do we provide personal counseling and well-being programs? Yes, we have Mr. Phil Steffi. Student access to health care has been a source of dissatisfaction. Our students are uh, eligible to receive uh, care at the University Health Center. Many choose to do that. <clears throat> We're trying to improve awareness of the resources available to students. We're having a town hall tomorrow evening at 5 o'clock with the medical students to talk about this. <clears throat> Non-involvement of providers of student health services and student assessment. <clears throat> so if you've provided health care to one of our medical students, you're not supposed to be involved in assessing that student's performance. And in fact, if you have any conflict of interest related to that medical student, you shouldn't be assessing them. So you have rental property and a student's renting one of your <coughs> apartments. You shouldn't be involved in assessing them. Uh, a student is dating your son or daughter. You shouldn't be involved in assessing that student. You have a conflict of interest there. Uh, we do not maintain student health records in the College of Medicine. <coughs> Things like immunization records and Student physical exams when they come in are maintained in something called My Record Tracker, which the student has control of. Student health and disability insurance, big, uh, not disability, but health insurance, been a big source of student dissatisfaction. Uh, we've identified a plan through Farm Bureau that appears within their budget to be reasonable quality care. That's one of the things that will be talked about tomorrow. We defined immunization requirements based on AAMC and CDC standards. <clears throat> we monitor compliance with that through the My Record Tracker system. <clears throat> we have policies for if students get occupational exposures, needle sticks, scalpel cuts, that sort of thing, what they do. We also have a policy that says if you acquired an infection through clinical exposures, how does that relate to disability and your ability to continue to function as a student? So those are the standards and elements. You can see they cover a whole lot of stuff. So where are we now? <clears throat> we have a survey visit coming up in five weeks, October 27th through 30th. So Tuesday, five weeks from now, will be the second day of our survey visit. In 2015-16, <clears throat> we went through our last comprehensive review of the curriculum. We developed implementation plans for curricular changes in 16-17. We implemented those plans in the 2017-18 academic year. And that was the year of record for our database that goes into the uh, LCME. We worked on refining those curricular changes last year and have continued to work on refining them this year. Part of the LCME process is doing a self-study. Part of the self-study is the Independent Student Analysis, or ISA. The students are in charge of this. They have some required questions LCME has, says they have to include, and then there are other questions they can choose to include. They deployed that. It's been over uh, almost a year and a half ago now. It was April of 2018 when that data was collected. Uh, in the summer of 18, we kicked off the Institutional Self-Study Task Force and perform, uh, developed uh, various self-study subcommittees. We had five. In the summer of 2018, we started assembling the data collection instrument. Um, <clears throat> this summer, we found our site visitors. I'll show you that in a minute. And we have our site survey visit coming up. Uh, in five weeks. So students' roles in this process is to organize and participate in the independent student analysis. They have served as members of the self-study subcommittees and a selected uh, few of them will meet with site visitors when they come. So the faculty have a variety of roles. So one is to ensure that educational program is conducted in compliance with the standards. <clears throat> we define learning objectives. We <clears throat> try and deliver excellent educational experiences. We ensure that the curricular elements fit into a cohesive whole. They fit into these institutional educational objectives over here. Not everybody's teaching the same thing, but we're teaching complementary pieces. The faculty are responsible for assessing student performance <clears throat> and participating in relevant institutional committees. 
faculty participated in the self-study process. I'm sure several of you were on self-study committees. Faculty also participated in the survey visit. <clears throat> so we had a mock survey visit uh, from September 8th through 10th. It was uh, shorter than a full survey visit. It was from Sunday to midday Tuesday instead of from Sunday to midday Wednesday. Our visitors were Dr. Lois Nora, who's previous dean at Northeast Ohio and Commonwealth University, and Dr. Kevin Dorsey, who's previous dean at Southern Illinois University, currently the interim president there. And uh, so they gave uh, uh, some general observations. They said one of the things that's important is <clears throat> making sure that we're portraying things in a positive sense as opposed to a negative sense. They said, for example, instead of saying we're really worried about not having enough faculty to teach because we got older faculty and there will be a lot of people retiring, to say we have sufficient faculty to uh, teach and our recruitment plans account for needing to replace retiring faculty, and that's true. Uh, <clears throat> or to say we struggle with competition with DO students for clinical placements, that should uh, frame that from the perspective of we have sufficient clinical placements to achieve our educational objectives. Or we're aware that there's competition with DO students and we're working to manage that. Uh, on our strategic plan, there was a lot of discussion about, oh yeah, we had one and nobody did anything with it and we put it on the shelf. And that's only partially true. We actually did quite a bit that was on that strategic plan, particularly in the areas of undergraduate medical education, graduate medical education, and research. And we accomplished a fair amount of what we said. So we did use that to guide a lot of what we did, and now we're working on developing a new one. Uh, <clears throat> they talked about the importance of feeling comfortable talking about successes. There's a lot we're doing well. Uh, they talked about the importance of thinking about how the different parts of our system work together as a whole to help us accomplish our mission. They said we should look for opportunities to talk about mission. They saw more about mission in our data collection instrument than they're accustomed to seeing from schools, and they said we were hoping to hear about that from uh, people we met with more than we did. So what are you doing to help accomplish the mission? What do you do to help accomplish the, the mission of uh, training future physicians who will serve in uh, underserved areas and rural areas and primary care and specialty areas. We're all doing things to help accomplish that mission. <clears throat> when asked about problems, they said, how could you respond to show that we use problems as an opportunity for improvement, that we work on continuous quality improvement? And we do. We do course evaluations when there are problems. We look at that. We say, what could we change? We make changes. We implement those changes, we reevaluate the data and see how we're doing. And they said when you could actually cite data, that was uh, uh, a bonus. When these uh, visitors come, <clears throat> each of them before they come has been assigned some of these elements. They're going to be primarily responsible for writing a response for. And they will have drafted a response before they get here. But when you have this database, it's often difficult to figure out all the answers or sometimes you see conflicting things, or sometimes you see things and say, I wonder if they're really doing that. So these visits are an opportunity <clears throat> for them to triangulate things. It's what I read in the database, the same as what Dr. Schoberg says, the same as what Dr. Johnson says, or are they different? Are we getting a, a similar picture here? Are things that, and the students, right, because they meet with the uh, students uh, twice, uh, M1, M2 on Monday, <clears throat> M3, M4 on uh, Tuesday, and so is what we say we're doing, the, the students say we're doing that. And it's also used just to help with questions, because there are times you just can't figure all this stuff out and you need to be able to ask somebody. Um, so they gave the example in a pre-clerkship course uh, director meeting that helped uh, that a faculty member could verify an action that MSEC had taken to address a problem. <coughs> they also said, <clears throat> be familiar with relevant policies like our workload policy, our time policy regarding uh, class activities. They said have ready examples of CQI available. What have you done in your area to look at data to make changes and to follow up data to see that you're improving? Uh, they didn't really understand from our written documentation the rural track, and so they said having prepared a, a three-minute elevator speech on what the rural track is would be helpful. Dr. McGowan's uh, hard at work on that. <clears throat> we had a few people that seemed cavalier in the process, and uh, they said, this is serious. Everybody needs to take it seriously. And 
those Cavalier people know now. Um, they recommended that we have everybody sign a conflict of interest disclosure annually. They should say, they said we should make sure students are aware of health options. We have that town hall tomorrow evening <clears throat> that all students needed to know about how to handle occupational exposures. We're working on that. They said faculty need to understand the relationship between the institutional educational objectives and their individual course and clerkship objectives and how those are mapped. How <clears throat> when you have a course objective that says you know about mitochondrial structure, how does that map to these institutional objectives? <clears throat> they used the term competencies and they said we should make sure that everybody knows that competency is the same as objectives. So they thought areas of vulnerability for us were in strategic planning and uh, I agree with that and we're working on that. Uh, in diversity, that's been an area for us before. Uh, we're trying to make our response a little crisper than we had submitted previously. Um, <clears throat> They thought the competition with PA and DO programs was a potential area of vulnerability. They thought curricular concerns were not going to be about the curriculum as a whole. In fact, they commented that when we look at the letter that you got in 2011, this looks like a whole different school now in terms of the process you've got in, in place. They, we think you're managing your curriculum, but concerns are more likely to be related to individual courses where student evaluations have been very low. <coughs> So I want to talk briefly about mistreatment. We have a, a student mistreatment policy. It's been updated this year. The policy is found in the catalog, which is online. Dr. Patty Amadio is a new College of Medicine grievance officer. She was appointed this summer. We instituted an anonymous online reporting system for students that became available in July of this year, and we have received some reports through that. <clears throat> These are the categories that AAMC asked about for student mistreatment on the graduation questionnaire annually. So public embarrassment and humiliation, not surprisingly, are the most common categories reported nationwide. Physical harm, either threatened or actual, being required to perform personal services not related to educational activities, being denied opportunities for training based on gender, race, ethnicity, or, uh, sexual orientation or religion, or receiving lower grades being based on those categories, being subjected to offensive remarks based on those categories, being subjected to unwanted sexual advances, being asked to exchange sexual favors for grades, <clears throat> or being, subject to being subjected to negative or offensive behavior based on other personal beliefs or characteristics. So those are categories of student mistreatment. Uh, so when the survey team comes, it consists of a chair. A chair is usually a dean or a former dean, and the chair leads the discussions at the session. There's the secretary who coordinates uh, the visit. So the team secretary is the person who has contact with us prior to the visit and says, we need this, we need that. And they're responsible for writing the report. <clears throat> there are members, there are usually two other members that review the data and they lead the discussion relevant to their assigned elements. At many visits, <clears throat> there is a faculty fellow who is a faculty member at a school that's going to be going through the accreditation process within the next year or so who's there to sort of learn the ropes but they participate as a team member and here's our team uh, Dr. Uh, Bob DePaolo is the Dean at Kentucky he's going to be the team chair Dr. Tina Thompson is the senior associate dean for academic affairs at Central Michigan University she's the team secretary uh, Ramsey and I both know her we've been on teams with her before um, she's fair she's demanding uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Deborah Vaughn is a professor at Boston University. She's a team member. Dr. Julie Niedermeyer is a professor at Ohio State. She's a team member. And the faculty fellow is Dr. Jeff Talman, who's the assistant dean for medical education. And I forgot to put this institution. I think it's Nebraska. Does that sound right? Okay. <clears throat> so what happens after the visit? Survey team prepares a report. <clears throat> After six or eight weeks, they send it to the LCME secretariat to review the draft. They make suggestions, send it back to the team. The team secretary sends it to the team members. Then it goes to the dean of the medical school, so it come to Dr. Block. <clears throat> After that, if Dr. Block has any corrections of uh, fact or uh, has concerns about tone, he can write a letter to address that. Then it goes to the LCME four to five weeks prior to the meeting. We hope this is going to be ready to go to the February meeting, um, and it probably will, but we don't know that with certainty. 
the LCME reviews the report at its convened meeting. It makes an independent determination about compliance with the standards based on the report and discussion. And then the secretary notifies the school within 30 days when the committee meets. <clears throat> so the LCME can find that for these different elements, you're satisfactory. You're satisfactory, but there's a need for monitoring. We're going to get some of those because areas where we've changed things, we've changed our grading policy recently. Our academic advising, Dr. Daniels has been new for a year. Uh, those are areas where we'll probably get satisfactory with monitoring or unsatisfactory. We hope we won't get any unsatisfactories. And then the actions can be continued full accreditation, which is what we expect, warning, which is what we got in 2011, uh, probation, which is a bad thing to get, and withdrawal of accreditation, which almost never happens. What questions do you all have? It'll be a fun time. <laughs> Okay, don't forget, if you're interested in the book club, uh, Grit by Angela Duckworth. Uh, Dr. McGowan has more copies. Don't be shy about taking the last two. It will be in January. You'll get the exact date, location, closer to time. Thanks for being here. That's 16th. If you, didn't, if you didn't sign in on the way in, sign in on the way out.